Hey all, welcome back to the Real Life Pharmacology Podcast. I'm your host, pharmacist Eric Christensen. And today on the episode, I am going to cover benztropine, which the brand name for that medication is Cogentin. Now, it's not a medication that's used incredibly often, and at least in my practice, in my experience, uh, the most uh, common situation I've seen it used for uh, is drug-induced extrapyramidal symptoms. And the most common class of medications that cause these adverse effects are antipsychotics. So these can be, you know, antipsychotics can obviously be super helpful uh, in patients with schizophrenia, for example, in uh, reducing, you know, psychosis, hallucinations, delusions, things of that nature. Uh, however, they can cause uh, these movement adverse effects, uh, which are called extrapyramidal symptoms. And so benztropine uh, can be used to help uh, manage this adverse effect. Now, I, I do want to caution um, that the drug is not really intended to be used for uh, prophylaxis. So, for instance, uh, we don't give, you know, risperidone and automatically give benztropine with it. We actually wait generally for these patients uh, to develop these adverse effects, and sometimes they don't have extrapyramidal symptoms. But in the event that a patient is uh, really, really uh, responsive to the antipsychotic, uh, and we have maybe tried alternative agents, and they're having these troublesome extrapyramidal symptoms, but we feel that the benefit of keeping it on board uh, is actually worth it for the patient in just managing those side effects. So that's where benztropine uh, I've seen it used most uh, in that setting. Um, important uh, differentiation, it is not uh, recommended for management of tardive dyskinesia. And now tardive dyskinesia is more of a longer term uh, adverse effect or complication from antipsychotic therapy that can result in uh, movement disorders as well. Um, but the, the way to differentiate extrapyramidal symptoms or EPS from TD, tardive dyskinesia, is really the timing is probably the easiest way. And extrapyramidal symptoms are going to happen generally within days or weeks of initiating uh, antipsychotic therapy or increasing a dose versus tardive dyskinesia. Generally, that's going to be months, um, probably more likely years uh, later that that's going to develop from long-term use of, of antipsychotics. So, you know, we're talking about, you know, this, this medication and extrapyramidal symptoms. Uh, it's also classified as an anti-Parkinson's type agent. And if I recall correctly, and, and don't quote me on that, I think it was one of the first um, agents uh, used in the management of Parkinson's disorder. And there's a, there's the thought with Parkinson's that there's kind of this uh, disequilibrium uh, between uh, dopamine and acetylcholine. And this drug is an anticholinergic medication. So it's anticholinergic activity uh, basically blocks uh, the action of acetylcholine, which again is thought to um, kind of play a role in Parkinson's. Dopamine is generally the first neurotransmitter uh, that we think about with uh, Parkinson's because we you know, certainly give cinnamon. We replace dopamine basically and go listen to, to that podcast if you want more information on that, uh, on that drug specifically. But um, just remember that kind of um, potential for acetylcholine to, to play a role there as well. So that may lead you to the question, okay, why isn't benztropine or cogentin used more in Parkinson's disorder? Well, the big problem with it is its adverse effect profile, and particularly as you escalate doses. So remember, this medication is an anticholinergic type medication. So dry eyes, dry mouth, uh, urinary retention, constipation, all very, very... Uh, bothersome, annoying, adverse effects for patients, for sure. And sometimes, obviously, can be pretty harmful and serious. 
Uh, we've also, with anticholinergics, we've got, you know, increasing fall risk. You know, many patients with Parkinson's are generally older, so they may not, you know, tolerate these medications that well anyway. Uh, it can contribute to uh, confusion, um, dementia-type symptoms, delirium. And so uh, these drugs are, are tough uh, to take, especially maybe at, at higher doses. One other thing to consider as you escalate doses with this drug is it can cause an anhydrosis type situation, uh, which could potentially lead to hyperthermia, so elevation uh, in temperature. And obviously, you know, there's certain things that may increase the, the risk of this, obviously, as we escalate the dose, um, you know, but patients may be living in, in warmer weather, warmer climates, you know, they're outside exercising, they, they get warmed up. Uh, you know, alcoholic type patients may be at, you know, water deficit, may be able to, to less respond better to uh, temperature changes. Same thing with elderly. You know, their body may not adapt uh, quite as well and they may be more intolerant uh, to that potential adverse effect. Uh, rarely, you may see some changes in heart rate, particularly as we, we escalate doses. Um, I always think about, you know, atropine being used to help in a bradycardia situation. Atropine is an anticholinergic drug, so any anticholinergic can potentially cause this. Um, you know, generally in, in most anticholinergics, we're using lower doses, and it's probably not an issue. But I do want to mention it just in case you've got a patient on a you know, large number of anticholinergics. Maybe they're sensitive to, to tachycardia for some other reason as well. Let's take a quick break and I'll finish up on drug interactions after the break here. If you enjoy the podcast, uh, want to support the podcast, go visit meded101.com slash store. Uh, great books for everyone. Um, if you're a nurse, nurse practitioner, physician, med student, pharmacist, of course, uh, definitely go check out the resources there. Uh, we've got books with clinical pearls, drug interactions, case studies, uh, and also we've got a, a, a agreement with Audible uh, where you can get your first book for free. So if you want to you know, test it out, get six, eight hours of, of free content, definitely go uh, follow the link there at meded101.com slash store. If you're a pharmacist specifically, a pharmacy student, uh, check out our NAPLEX content, BCPS, BCACP, uh, BCGP and uh, medication therapy management certification study materials now as well. So all at meded101.com slash store and thanks for the support. All right, finishing up on drug interactions, I think um, the first thing I think about when I think about an anticholinergic medication, you know, in this case, benztropine, and um, other drug interactions is I think about uh, the anticholinergic effect and you may hear that term anticholinergic load. And I think about patients who are taking other medications that may have uh, anticholinergic effects. Uh, so for instance, one of the most you know, common medications I see uh, patients take, particularly geriatric patients, is uh, Benadryl or diphenhydramine for sleep. And that could certainly have additive uh, anticholinergic effects, dry mouth, dry eyes, confusion, so on and so forth. Uh, other, you know, medications, so uh, respiratory anticholinergics, I think about ipotropium, maybe teotropium, there's definitely others in that class as well, um, but think about those. <clears throat> Generally, they, they don't have as much for systemic adverse effects, uh, but probably the most common one I see kind of additive if a patient's already on anticholinergics is uh, dry mouth, certainly, because these uh, drugs are inhaled and um, certainly around the mouth area, they can, can certainly have a good activity there, or negative activity, maybe I should say, at causing that dry mouth. Uh, urinary incontinence drugs, uh, oxybutynin, tolteridine are a couple of common ones there that have anticholinergic effects. Uh, drugs that can be used for uh, anxiety and itch and sleep, uh, maybe a doxepin. Uh, maybe uh, hydroxyzine, for example, there, uh, tricyclic antidepressants, um, you know, your amitriptylines, your nortriptylines, things of that nature. So definitely, you know, review that medication list. It's something that I always do. Um, go through there, making sure that we're not, you know, having multiple drugs that have anticholinergic effects and the patient's uh, presenting with some of those adverse effects. 
Uh, other medications, I think, you know, with um, additive adverse effects. So constipation, for example, um, just a quick example there. You know, patients maybe who are taking opioids and anticholinergics, well, those are two drugs that are really, really constipating uh, that could really have some additive effects there. And one uh, last one I, I did want to mention, you got to think about dementia medications. Um, I think about acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, uh, so a drug like denepazil. And you got to remember that benztropine uh, can uh, potentially blunt, block the effects of that medication and worsen uh, cognitive impairment, contribute to confusion, and all sorts of things like that. Uh, that's enough today on Benstropine. Thanks so much for listening. Hope you enjoyed the podcast, picked up a pearl or two. And uh, if you enjoy the show, leave us a rating review on iTunes or wherever you're listening. Uh, incredibly appreciative for that. Uh, go snag your free 31-page PDF at reallifepharmacology.com. Simply subscribing and getting uh, email updates as to when we have a new podcast um, will get you access uh, to that PDF. Great little resource for uh, anybody preparing for a board exam, uh, pharmacy students, pharmacology exams, um, great little resource on the top uh, 200 drugs there. I'm going to sign off for today. You can uh, reach out to me at reallifepharmacology.com um, or meded101.com. Also find me on uh, LinkedIn. I'm fairly active on there as well. Uh, thanks for listening. I appreciate uh, the support, all the kind words that I've received from from you all out there, uh, signing off for today.